Hallelujah. Good morning. Absolutely great to be with you once again. God is good. The devil is bad. All the time you are right. <laughs> Hallelujah. He has no good plans for you, the devil. But God has good plans for us to prosper us and not to harm us. To give us a future and a hope. Uh, I hear too much feedback in my ears here. Maybe I'm on monitors, Pastor Quibbers, just to get me maybe off the monitors. I don't like to hear myself speak. At the moment, I can hear myself talking too much behind me. Okay, good. Are you good? Are you, are you happy? Are you blessed? Amen. God has blessed us with beautiful rain, didn't he? Wow, last night as I woke up in the middle of the night and I just heard the rain coming down and down and down. And I just thank God. I can almost hear the grass growing. <laughs> We've had such good rain over the last uh, few weeks. We are really blessed. So this morning, we are from, from my side, welcome. If you are visiting us for the first time this morning, this is an awesome family. It's probably one of the best places to worship on a Sunday morning, really. It's awesome to be together with this family. Um, we are struggling with our online um, connection this morning. The internet is really down, then it's up, then it's down. It's probably because of load shedding. So for the people that's watching us online, you may be not watching us online now, I doubt it. But, uh, but we will do our best and record and then put it up, up later. So we are busy with a sermon series, a very short one. I told you we're going to do a three-week sermon series on uh, the fruit of the Spirit. And you might remember that when we started out, I've had it on the, on the board behind me, on the screen, where I said that we have the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit and we have the nine, nine parts of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You might remember that. And that's all the Holy Spirit. And I said we're not going to talk about the gifts now, uh, the gifts, the nine gifts on this side. Um, we're not going to focus on that. The gifts, is, they are gifts. It's a gift. You can't boast about it. It's a gift from God. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's mainly the work of the Holy Spirit. On the other hand, we have the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's nine parts as well. And that fruit is our responsibility. It's also a work of the Spirit. But we are responsible to allow that to grow in us and uh, be seen by the people around us. I actually explained to you, when we started out, I explained to you that uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which we're not talking about now, uh, we find them in 1 Corinthians 12 and also 14. And then smack in the middle, we have the love chapter, chapter 13. 12, 12 and 14, 13 in the middle. The gifts must always operate in love. If it's not glued with love in between, it's boasting yourself. Then we're just boasting about us, how great we are, if it's not driven by love. We then focused on uh, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to ask you just to put that scripture on the screen for me um, Galatians 5 verse 22, that is our anchor verse for these three weeks. Galatians 5 verse 22, it starts off in, uh, I think it's verse 19, where it says the, the works of the flesh are, and then it mentions the, work of the works of the flesh, and then it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is. So we're focusing on the fruit of the Spirit. If you can just have that one on the, on the screen for me, Galatians 5 verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these, there are no law. So the point is this. There's nine of them. We've worked through six. We've got three left. I just want to recap very quickly for those who haven't been here for the last two weeks. I said to you in the beginning, why do we need the fruit of the Spirit? And there's two reasons. I said to you, the fruit of the Spirit is there because we are an open letter to the world. And when people look at us, they see the fruit of the Spirit. They see love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, self-control. They see those things. And Paul says, we are the ambassadors of Christ. People look at us and they want to see Jesus there. Amen. Hello? So that was the first reason we are ambassadors of Christ. Paul says we are an open letter to the world. They didn't read their Bibles, they read us. And that might lead them to the Bible, but they read us. The second reason I said to you is to protect us. I actually had people standing in the front here. They formed a circle which represented all the different parts of the fruit of the Spirit. And I said, when you have love, when you have joy, when you have peace, when you have patience, when you have gentleness, kindness, self-control, all these things, they protect you from the enemy. And in the area that we are lacking, that is the area where the devil comes in and he gets us. If I'm struggling with patience, he will get me on that spot every single time. So I have to grow in patience. If I'm lacking in kindness, he will get me on that shot every time. And I have to grow in kindness. So it protects me when I live with the fruit of the Spirit in my life. That was the first Sunday we spoke about that. And we ended up with two of them. And they said, we spoke about love and joy. 
And I want to just say this about joy before we go on. I said to you, it's so important to have that part of the fruit of the Spirit. Love is obviously the foundation. Joy. If you're a Christian, you have to understand the joy of the Lord, which is my strength, must not be confused with happiness. Because happiness depends on happenings. When things are good, I'm happy. When things are bad, I'm unhappy. Joy of the Lord comes from in. Having the next fruit, which is peace. Peace with God that passes all understanding. You don't understand why you have the peace while there's a storm on the outside. That joy flows from that peace where you know that God says, I've got this. When you go through difficult times, God says, I've got this. I'm with you. I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Therefore, you can still have joy in the midst of the storm. Love, joy, first Sunday. Second Sunday, we spoke about, yeah, that was quite a full one. We spoke about a healthy tree produces healthy fruit. So we must make sure our tree is healthy. We as a tree must be healthy to produce healthy um, fruit. <laughs> fruit, produce healthy fruit. I just want you to speak back to me because you are fairly quiet yeah. And I said there was three things. We must have good soil. A tree that's planted in good soil, which speaks of you must be rooted in the Word of God. It also said you must water it. It speaks about walking in the Spirit. The walking in the Spirit is compared with watering it. And then the last one I said last Sunday was, we must understand the process of pruning. When God prunes us, He cuts us back. It's painful, but the intention is to produce more fruit. That's the, that's the plan. So then we spoke about peace, patience, kindness, and goodness. That was last Sunday. Now this morning we have three left. And we are going to look at the next three that we have to do, which is faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So we're going to dive into faithfulness this morning. Are you good? That was a recap. For those who missed the last two Sundays, now you're with us. Faithfulness. Now, when I, when I prepared the sermon... I, I went into a, looking into the dictionary. What does the dictionary say of the word faithfulness? And obviously, if you break up this word faithfulness, which is the fruit of the Spirit, which we should have, faithfulness, faithfulness, it kind of says, this guy seemed to be full of faith, faithfulness, full of faith. So it must be connected with my faith if we say I'm faithfulness. That's what I have. Now, faithful means three things. To be consistent in your beliefs. To be consistent in your beliefs. It means you have a certain belief, you hold on to that belief, and you are consistent in believing that thing. That is a kind of important to be consistent in your belief. That's being faithful. To be loyal and steadfast. And to be true to the facts. Which means, while you are serving God in faithfulness, you are not swayed by every guy telling you this or that. You stay faithful in what you believe. You are a faithful kind of a person. This means simply that my actions and my beliefs, they must come together. Because I can't say I believe this thing, but my actions is a completely different thing. They must line up with one another. My actions and my beliefs must line up with one another. Now this basically comes down to, if I say to you, that's a very faithful person. Man, this guy is faithful. It kind of comes down to, he's faithful in life. Because you can be faithful at work, and maybe not faithful in marriage. Or maybe not faithful in how you look after your body. Or not faithful, because being faithful in life means we have to be faithful in so many areas of life. My whole life. Because that is a testimony to the world out there. Being faithful as a person. Not faithful only in something. For instance, if I say... I must be faithful in marriage. That comes down to I'm faithful in marriage because uh, I can say I'm faithful in marriage because I do not cheat on my spouse. But that's a do not one. I'm, I'm faithful because I do not cheat on my spouse. But this other side of the coin, I must be faithful in doing the vows that I made when I stood before the altar, before God and before man, and I said, I do. And I said, I'm going to cherish you. I'm going to love you. Until death do us part, I must be faithful to my vows doing the right thing, doing certain things, not only not doing stuff, being faithful in marriage, being faithful at my workplace, being faithful as a friend. 
You know, being faithful as a friend is faithfulness, which means I'm, I'm faithful as a friend. When my friend goes through difficult times, I'm there with him. When he's making nonsense, I'm prepared to tell him the hard truth. You are making nonsense. Hello? That's a good friend. You don't just leave your friends to slide down the gutters. No, you tell them, dude, you're on the wrong path. Come on. Get yourself in order. That's a good friend. And then you help them and you lead them. That's a faithful friend. Faithful to God. <laughs> Being faithful to God means faithful in my worship. Faithful in my prayer life. Faithful in my relationship with God. Faithful in loving God and loving people. It means I'm faithful in those things. That's faithfulness that we need to uh, make sure that we grow in. Faithful in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in giving. Faithful in caring to, with people. Faithful in loving. Faithful in supporting somebody when they are down and out. You know the thing about being faithful is um, you have to make up your mind about certain things. And I always say this. When you've made up your mind about something, I'm going to be faithful in this, then you must just walk in what you've made up your mind with. You don't have to go back to it every time. Should I or should I not? My goodness, I wonder if I should this time. No, no. You make up your mind about it and you are faithful in it. And I remember so clearly, if I could just testify to my own life. I remember so clearly when uh, we were still very young Christians. I committed my life to Jesus at the age of 21, 1984. Radical transformation in my life. Was born again. My life turned around like this. And I remember in those first years when we started learning about God and about how does things work and being faithful. And one of the things we've learned early in life was to be faithful in your giving. And uh, that's why when all these other people talk about a lot of stuff and have a lot of arguments, I don't care what they say because I've made up my mind in 1985 and I've stuck to that principle my whole life. I didn't have to go back to that and maybe I was wrong. And no, because I just decided to stick to it. Being faithful in what I believe. And I started tithing, my wife and I. When we were still young, we had nothing. It was our difficult years when we, uh, we, we call it our Marmite, Marmite and Marmite days. When, uh, when she would ask me, what can I put on your psalmies to work? And I know there was nothing in the house except Marmite. And then she would ask me, would you like Marmite? Marmite or Marmite? And I said, the middle one, I love Marmite. Give me that one. It was our, we call it our Marmite days. Marmite, Marmite or Marmite days. And I remember so clearly, those days for those younger generation, there was a thing called a check, when people could still be trusted. You know, when you would write a check, give a guy a check of whatever, and that was actually representing money. And you can go to the bank and cash that, they would give you money. Now today you can't do that anymore. And I remember so clearly, one Sunday morning, we were, not, we were, we were financially under stress, and I wrote out my check for my tithe, and as I was tearing it out of the little book, does anybody know that little checkbook? Remember it? Good memories, eh? My wife walks into the room. She says, what are you doing? I say, I'm writing out our tithe check. I'm going to drop it in the church this morning. She said, are you nuts? We have no food in the house. The whole month is still ahead of us. You can't do that. I said, hey, whoa, we've made up your mind about this. We're going to be faithful, full of faith, trusting God that even when the cupboards are empty, He will provide for us. So we folded it up and we put it in the envelope and we dropped it in the chest at church. In the little bag we had actually. And that, because we made up our mind about it, we never had to have that discussion again, ever. We decided that. And all these years, all these years, and I know there's people who say that is law, blah, blah, blah. I don't care that it's a law or not a law. I'm saying it's a principle. God has given a principle to His people, the Jews, because He wants them to prosper more than any other nation. And when, you, when I, as a heathen, born-again believer, come and I take the law that He has given to the Jews and I apply it to my life, it works for my life too, because it's a godly principle. Simple as that. It's not a law. It's a godly principle, and that is why the Jewish nation, as small as it is, is probably the most prosperous nation in the world. Because they apply godly principles. So I don't have to go back. I don't have to argue with somebody. I don't have to wonder, should I? I've just been doing it for the last 36 years. And it's been working for me. I can testify to it. And that's why I don't have to go back. So when you decide to be faithful to God about whatever, you decide, I'm going to be faithful in my marriage. You don't have to go back. You just remain faithful. Every time a nice cherry walks past, you don't think, oh, should I be faithful or should I not? 
No, you've decided you're going to be faithful, so you don't have to think about it twice. You don't go there. You just don't go there because you've already made up your mind. You're going to be a faithful servant of the living God. You decided that already. Now, to me, being faithful to God, one of the most beautiful stories in the Word of God is this one. Daniel chapter 3, we find it there, the story. Now, I just want to give you the background very quickly in Daniel chapter 3. It works like this. The people of God were in Israel. They were not listening to to the prophet Jeremiah, when Jeremiah was raised up by God and said, you guys must stop, it with your, stop with your wicked living, because God has said to me, if you don't stop this, he will send the king Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon, he was going to come here, he will kill many men, he will destroy Jerusalem, he will destroy the temple, and he will take you away captive, if you don't repent. They said, ah, who are you? They didn't listen. It happened. Exactly that way. city was destroyed, everything. They took them away into exile, into Babylon. And that's where they were. Then Jeremiah writes to them, Jeremiah chapter 29, he writes to them and says, while you are in a foreign land, do not give up hope. Because you see, the thing is this, when we have been disobedient, if we are unfaithful, God remains faithful. God is not connected to my unfaithfulness. When you and I are unfaithful, God remains faithful to His promise. And he said he will make the nation of Israel prosperous. Even when they decided to be unfaithful and they went on the gravel road where they could have been on the tar road. They went the detour when they could have been on the straight and the narrow. They decided even in that time, God is faithful. And God comes and he says through the prophet Jeremiah, while you are in a foreign land, don't sit and sulk. What you need to do is plant, harvest. Build houses for yourself. Because in the city where you are, if you bless that city, pray for that city. Where you are blessed, I want to bless you. Where you are, I will bless you. Amongst those people that were taken away were four young boys. Daniel and three of his buddies. Now they've grown up. It was King Nebuchadnezzar. Now later it's King Darius has taken over. He's now leading. He's the man in charge in King Darius. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me rewind quickly. We'll get to King Darius just now. We're going to rewind a little bit. These young boys have now grown up. They've been faithful to God in a foreign land. And then King Nebuchadnezzar have a, um, an image made that the people have to worship. A massive image. So he said, get the band ready. Let the band play. The band plays. The whole nation must bow down before this image. And as the music starts to play, the band plays the music, blah, blah, blah. The whole nation, like people like you sitting there, but there's like thousands of them. They all bow down before this image. And as the king sits on his throne, he says, hey, wait a minute. There's three guys standing at the back there. Who's those three guys? Why are they not bowing? He sends the guy, hey, who's those guys? I don't know. Go fetch them. They bring the three guys in front of the king. Here's the three guys standing. Why are you not bowing down? I said, you must bow down. They said, oh, king, let it be known to you. Now, this part is... Daniel chapter 3, part in in the word I love so much. It says this, O king, let it be known to you that we serve the living God and we will not bow down to any other idol, any other thing except the living God. He says to him, listen, don't you know who I am? I am the king. I have the power to throw you in the fire and kill you. And will your God then save you? It's the question they ask. Their response is absolutely beautiful. The response is, O king, he says, I'm going to give you another chance. We're going to play the music. Then I want you to bow down. They say, O king, don't bother the musicians. (laughs) Because we ain't going to do it. We're not doing it. Don't bother them. Because let it be known to you, O king. Now listen to this. Our God is able to save us out of that fire. But if he does not save me from the fire... I will still not worship your idol. You see, that is being faithful. That is trusting God. Even if I go through fire, I will not break my promise that I made to God to be faithful to Him and worshiping Him alone. That is faithfulness. Not only for what we can get, not only for when He does provide for me, then I will be faithful. Now, even if I die in that fire, I will remain faithful. That is faithfulness. It's not about the outcome. 
It's not about will it benefit me. No, it's about what my relationship is with God and that fruit of the Spirit says, I'm going to be faithful. Even when I lose my job, even when things are difficult, even when my marriage goes through a very difficult time, even when my family rejects me, I will remain faithful to the living God. That's what it's all about. And what happened was, the king was so furious, for those who don't know the story, I can't leave you hanging here, can I? So what happened was, uh, the king was furious. He says, heat up that fire, seven times more. And even the guys who were throwing in the, the coals, they got burned to death. That's how hot it became. And he said, throw them in, and as they throw, threw them into the fire, um, they went in. He was now satisfied, problem solved. Ha, that'll teach those guys. Anybody else want to stand? And then as he looks, he says, hey, wait a minute, what's happening? I can see there's three guys, but there's a problem. There's now four guys in the fire. Have we not, his words was, did we not put three guys in the fire? How is it that I see a fourth person in the fire, but that one looks like a son of God? What you need to know is when you are committed and you remain faithful, God will be there for you in your fire, in your trouble, in your difficulty, in your challenge that you face. God will never leave you, nor will He forsake you, because He's a faithful God. He's a faithful God. But we need to come to this place of faithfulness where we say, even if we die, we're going to remain faithful. Because God has the, has the habit of showing up, of showing up when He sees faithfulness, when He sees faith. It happened when Daniel um, ended up in the lion's den. Daniel ended up in the lion's den and he remained faithful to his calling. That's why he ended up in the lion's den. And God had the habit of showing up when he sees faithfulness. Hmm. Now, when we jump to Daniel chapter, chapter 6, I'm just going to explain it to you. I had the verse, but I'm just going to explain it to you. Daniel, Daniel chapter 6. This was his three buddies. This is now happened. This was just amazing. And now, that was King Nebuchadnezzar. So after this event, King Nebuchadnezzar makes the statement. He says, whoa, let those guys come out. And as they come out of the fire, the word of God says they didn't even smell like smoke. <laughs> Nothing. Like that's how God saves Daddy. Nebuchadnezzar makes the statement and says, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is the real God. That's the true God because they stood their ground. Now we move forward, number of years forward. We, we don't look at the three buddies. We look at Daniel for a moment. There's another king now, King Darius. And King Darius is now in charge. Daniel has been so faithful in the way that he did business that the king saw this man, although he's from another country, although he's, an, he's, a, he's another guy, not, doesn't, he's not part of the Babylonian empire, he says, I like this guy. He's faithful. When he says yes, he means yes. When he says no, he means no. You can rely on him. And then it says this, and he brought him in, and the, the king decided to appoint people over the nation. They called Daniel chapter 6, 120 satraps. It's, it's like people who will rule over the nation, 120. Over the 120, he put three guys at the top. One of the three was Daniel, a governor. He's one of the three governors to govern the 120. The 120 must govern the nation to make sure the king doesn't lose out on anything. But then the Word of God says, but Daniel was so exceptional in how he conduct everything that the king was, was going to put him up above these two. So it will be Daniel, the other two, and then the 120, and then the nation. And when they heard the king is planning to do that, they said, wait a minute, we need to find something. Let's go through his books. See, didn't he do corrupt deals or something? Didn't he, wasn't he big is calumny? And they started looking for something. Now listen to what the Word says here. We are in Daniel chapter 6. And I'm going to read uh, the, last, the last part of it. It says, So the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, his work. But they could not find any charge or fault because he was faithful. Nor was there any error or fault found in him. The NIV translation says, Nor was there any corruption found in him. Now, corruption is a problem, and it's a word that we, use, we hear all the time at our top structure. That is corruption in government, corruption in the country, corruption in the cops, corruption, corruption. And here the Word of God says, because Daniel was faithful, 
He did not allow himself to be involved in these kind of practices of corruption. Did you know that faithfulness, I'm still stuck at the first one, faithfulness. Don't worry, the other two is quick. Number one, still, I'm still at faithfulness. Listen to this. Faithfulness produces promotion. I want you to get this. Faithfulness produces promotion. If you and I are faithful at work and we are known as a faithful person, as a loyal person at work, as a person that can be relied upon, a reliable person, that leads to promotion. We saw it with Daniel. We saw it with Daniel. It doesn't, everything wasn't perfect, but Daniel remained faithful. It was after this event that he ended up in the lion's den, by the way. The thing is this, Matthew 24, I'm sorry, Matthew 25, I'm going to read that, to, I'm going to quote it for you. Matthew 25 for those people making notes. In Matthew 25, we find a scenario where Jesus comes, you still with me? Yes. Are you with me? Yes. The guy next to you is just say, hey, you must listen. There's a good one coming. There's a good one coming. Listen, there's a good one coming. If I would ask you this morning, would you like to be promoted at work? Maybe a lot of us would, go, would put hands up. Would we like to see our business being promoted to the next level? Yes, a lot of people would like to raise our hands. You see, there's a secret. Faithfulness produces promotion. Exactly, promotion. Listen to this. Matthew 25. Jesus is talking about the end times. He's explaining the, to his disciples what's going to happen in the end times. And then he comes to the story that he tells them. He says, the kingdom of God is like a man who goes on a long journey. And he calls his servants and he gives to the one uh, five bags of gold, two bags of gold, one bag of gold. That's what he gives to his disciples, to, to his servants. Then he goes away. After a long while, he comes back and he asks them, tell me what have you done with what I have entrusted you with? Obviously, this speaks about Jesus going to heaven, and at some stage, he will come back, and we're going to have to give account of what we have done with this life that he has given us. That's what it's all about. So now the first guy comes, and he walks up to Jesus. Matthew 25, from verse 14 onwards, you get this story. Go read it. He comes to Jesus. He comes to the master. Jesus tells the story. The first guy comes. He says, sir, you have entrusted to me five bags of gold. Look here. I have multiplied that five, and it's now become ten. There it is. He says, well done, good and good and faithful servant, because you have been faithful over little, I will trust you with much. Two bags of gold. Look, your master, I have come, and I, I've had two, and now I have four. Well done, good and Faithful servant, because you've been faithful over little, I will appoint you over much. Well done, awesome, it pr brings promotion. One bag, I was afraid, I'm going to hit it in the ground, and uh, yes, the one. I, I didn't take a risk. I'm not, I'm not those risky kind of guys. There's your, he said, you're lazy and you're wicked servant. You should at least have taken my money and deposited that money at the bank. But because you did not, let's take your bag and let's give it to the guy who now has ten. So he can have 11. Because those who have, even more will be given to them. And those who don't have, even what they have will be taken from them. And given to the guy who I can trust. There's a revelation in this that many people don't want to talk about. Because it sounds so unchristian to take it from this poor guy. Hey, that's not right, man. Sorry, dude. You can have it back. But that's what the... If God can trust us to be faithful, promotion follows. If He cannot trust us, what we even have, we will lose. Can we see why faithfulness is so important? When we are faithful in the little things, in obedience, God will promote us and He will trust us with a lot. Many people want a lot, but they can't be faithful in the little. Let's start being faithful with what God entrusts us with. And when we are faithful in that, then God will promote us. Promotion comes from God. You do not have to try to promote yourself. It comes from God. But you need to be faithful in what you do for God. Simple as that. This will be a good time to take up an offering, but let me not do it. 
Hallelujah. I'm just joking. Did you get that one? This to me is so important for us to get that one. He actually said, if you are faithful in the little things, I will make you a ruler over many things. That's what he says. I will make you a ruler over many things. Okay, there's two more to go. Then I'm done. Gentleness, and the last one is self-control. Gentleness. The meaning from the dictionary in gentleness is basically, I, I got into the dictionary, I got into the Greek, I got into the Aramaic. It means to be kind and tender, to be reasonable, to be friendly, to be fair, to be humble. That's the mean, that, what's the meaning of gentleness? Now, I know some people are naturally more gentle. They have a gentle and a soft spirit. For those guys, it's easy to just be gentle. For other people, it takes a bit of work to be gentle. Isn't that true? Because some people have a gentle spirit. That's how the personality is like that. And then some people are a bit more... I don't know what the word is there, but it's, that, it's the opposite. And that means it takes a bit of work to be gentle, to be kind and tender, to be reasonable, to be friendly, to be fair, and to be humble. Now... This does not mean if you are a gentle person, listen to this, it does not mean if you are gentle that you are a pushover or that you are without backbone or that you can't make your stand. It doesn't mean that at all. It means you just say where you stand without fighting about it. You just make your point. I remember when I just came to the Lord in my first year, a few years, I was a young man of 21 and I had a lot of, a lot of drinking buddies. That's what we did on weekends. And, uh, but now I stopped drinking, but I worked with these guys. Because I came to salvation radically. I came back to work. I didn't preach with them. And I didn't fight with them. I didn't argue with them. And they would ask me, are we going for a dop? I said, no, guys, you know I don't drink anymore. Come on. Come on. Let's go, Yanni, man. Let's go for a dop. Hey, guys, I told you I'm not, I don't drink anymore. I didn't swear at them. I didn't fight with them. I just said to them, I don't drink anymore. I'm fine. Thank you. Hey, Yanni, come on. Are you not a man anymore? I said, guys, come on, guys, guys, guys. Let's just let's look at what you just said now. Am I not a man anymore? Let's just have a look quickly. So you say, I'm not a man. I don't need any supplements to be a man. You are telling me you need a supplement to be a man. So who's not the man? Oh, come on, Yanni, man. Don't be clever like that, man. Don't be clever like this, man. No, come on, guys. If you need a dog to be a man, and I'm telling you, I am a man without the dot, so who's the man, man? <laughs> you don't have to fight about it. You can be nice about it. And then he will say to me, hey, but it makes you feel lacquer, man. It is lacquer. I say, no, actually, honestly, it's not lacquer. It's really not so nice. Honestly, you tell yourself it's nice. It makes you lacquer. I'm lacquer already. It's okay. Thank you. I'm lacquer without it. Just the thing is, you don't have to fight about your position. Somebody said to me the other day, their, their boss is such a gentle soul. He told him to go to hell in such a great way. He's looking forward to the journey. <laughs> Not really go to hell, but go to hell. Get out of my office. In such a gentle way, it doesn't even look like he's been fighting with him. Listen to what it says in Philippians 4 verse 5. This is the amplified version of the gentleness. To be gentle. Let your... If it's not the Amplified, the, the normal translation the, in New King James would say, let your gentleness be known to all men, the Lord is at hand. That's what it says. The Amplified says, let your gentle spirit, and then it explains it in brackets, your graciousness, that you are gracious to people, your unselfishness, your mercy that you show towards other people, your tolerance that you have, and your patience, let those things be known to all people, the Lord is near. Would it not be nice when people speak about us as, wow, that's a very tolerant person. He's so patient. You see, the thing is this. I explained that to you last week about the pastor who I have so much, my spiritual father, I have so much respect for him. Because when I was in a season of being really stupid and arrogant, and he was in a very mature season, he had patience with me. He was tolerant towards me, and he gave me time to grow. I want to say something here quickly to somebody that need to hear this. You see, the thing is sometimes when you've served the Lord for a while and you've grown and you know that you are a nice strong tree because you've got a very big trunk and you have nice trees, the, the little tree standing there, the, 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 it's just thin like this. 
It's just thin, and the little tree is still growing, and the little tree is very weak. And when the wind blows, it goes like this. And often in life, we or the people who are a bit more mature, they don't have grace for that and tolerant and patience for the little tree that's still busy growing. And they want to beat him into submission. And you must do this, and you must do this, and you must do this, because that's what the big tree does. But he's not a big tree yet. Hello. He's still growing into becoming a big tree like you might be. So let us have patience, tolerance, kindness, gentleness towards those around us that are not in the same season as us. Be patient with them while they are growing. Hey Amen. If I think back in my life, I've done so many stupid stuff. And thank God I'm still here. A lot of people will do stupid stuff around us. But be patient. We are all on a different journey, on a different season of life. Let's be gentle with one another during those seasons. The last one is self-control. I'm rushing a little bit. I'm running out of time. Self-control. You still okay with another 10 minutes? Still good with another? Did you say half an hour? What did you say? <laughs> Joking. 10 minutes, let's do it. The last one is self-control. This simply means, I mean, honestly, what does the word say? Self-control. Controlling yourself. That's like, you don't need a degree to understand that. Controlling yourself. Not controlling other people, just controlling me. I must control me. You must control you. How you speak, how you act, what you say, how you treat people, self-control. Now, sometimes self-control, uh, if we have it, it can stop us from landing in a lot of trouble, a lot, all kinds of things. Because so often we, we must have so, listened to the self-control in what we say and what we do. Listen to this. Self-control in what we say and in what we do. And these two must line up with one another. Because sometimes we say stuff. Ah, and we hurt people with words. Do you know that words can produce life? It can encourage people. But words can also kill people. Same words. Words that comes out of the mouth of a person can either uplift somebody and encourage them, or it can actually destroy somebody and push them completely down into the gutter. From the same mouth, Jesus says, they, no, not Jesus, the word of God declares that we, there can't be fresh water and uh, bitter water coming from the same mouth. We must be people who speak blessing. We must be speak of people who speak life, who speak encouragement, who tell that little tree, come on, you can make it, dude. Just keep on growing, keep on growing. You will have fruit shortly. Just keep on growing. Don't mind my fruit. Look at you. You are growing. Encourage rather than pushing down. Then showing the little tree, how ah, you have no fruit, look at you. No, no, encourage the little tree. You're going to get there, dude. If, uh, you see, if you and I have self-control, listen to the self-control, controlling myself. If I know, you know you have a vision in life, you want to go somewhere, that's your vision in front of you. You have to control yourself to not look at all the distractions on the side. Stay focused on where you're going with your life. You have to sometimes say no, no, so you can say yes to the things that you are aiming for in your life. Now, King David should have known better when he was walking on the roof of the temple and he was looking down and he saw Bathsheba taking a bath down there. What he should have done was to apply self-control and go inside and find a book to read. That's what he should have done. But he did not. He was staying out there. He didn't practice self-control and he continued looking at her, yo, and he, even uh, instead of asking for a book, he asked for the binoculars. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at Bathsheba who was bathing. And this thing escalated, I told you that last Sunday, it escalated. He had her come to the room and he had made her pregnant and he had to now orchestrate that he, her husband is being murdered on the battlefield. All because he did not apply exactly self-control. You see, self-control is what you must do before you end up in a lot of hot water. When you apply self-control here, you don't have to apologize later. Ah, man. If we, so, we self-control now, I don't have to go back again and say, yeah, I'm so sorry, I should never have said that, sorry. I should never have done that. Man, I'm sorry. So when we can grow in controlling, don't worry to control everybody else. Control yourself. Let me control me. Let you control you, but I will control me. 
And when we can all do that, hey, it will be a great world, wouldn't it? If we can all apply self-control. And uh, that's the story. And I'm going to end off with uh, something I want to tell you about self-control. And then uh, we're going we're gonna to still baptize a few people this morning quickly. Hang in there. I'm going to close with a story. Self-control. True story. I read it the other day about self-control. This couple, the guy who wrote this, this, uh, this article, he said the, next, the following thing happened. He and his wife decided they're going to go and just visit friends of theirs, another couple, went to that couple's house, and they're going to have coffee. Just they, they're going to have coffee. And uh, they, they sensed things were not so good in the house. It seems like there was a bit of a challenge. It was an atmosphere. And they're going to have coffee, and the wife went to the kitchen to make coffee. And as she went to the coffee, started the coffee, there's no milk. She shouts at the husband who was sitting with them, there's no milk! Did you not buy milk? He said, oh, I forgot to buy milk. I'm so sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I forgot to buy milk. Sorry. She said, you're pathetic. Can't you remember anything? You always forget everything. I'm so sick and tired of you. Goodness. I'm so, you must just come right, man. You are pathetic. And these couples, they said, oh, they kind of felt really uncomfortable with this situation. And he said, my love, I'm so sorry. I will just go rush to the store quick. I'll just go buy. So he jumps in his car. He goes, Phew. They say to her, why are you so rude with this guy? I mean, honestly, to forget milk is not the end of the world. We can drink without milk as well. No, I'm just tired of him not doing what he must do. He's really pathetic. They said, no, man, he's not pathetic. That, he does a lot of good things. Maybe this milk is... So the guy didn't come back after a while. They got the news. There was an accident. And a true story. There was an accident. They rushed to the scene. What happened was... Uh, he, was, he went to the shop, he bought the milk, and uh, he was driving, and somebody else skipped a red light. They hit him on the door, killing him instantly. True story. Killing him instantly, in his seat. When they arrived there, paramedics were there. He was still stuck in the car, but he was dead. On the back seat, there was a carton of milk, plus a red rose and a card. And they took it out. Gave it to her, the rose and the card. And the card, he bought the card with the milk. And he said, lovey, I'm so sorry that I forgot the milk. I will really try my best to be better. And if you want to leave me because of this, I will understand. And that was it. That woman could not forgive herself. She was crying every night. She went into full-blown depression. Stopped eating. After the funeral now, when everything was gone, and people were gone, and she was just left all alone. Six months later, she committed suicide. She couldn't forgive herself for that. Now listen to this. If she applied self-control, when she opened the cupboard and there was no milk, the husband would have made it still be alive. But because of milk, because of milk, she said, you are stupid, you are pathetic, you are useless of milk and you see we do this often our mouths when we don't apply self-control we can insult and we can say words that hurt somebody even when I go back and I say I'm so sorry I said that I didn't mean it the scars still remain there it can never be unsaid it's been said even though I say sorry it's still been said you can't unsay it and although the wound will heal, the scar will remain. So what am I saying to you? When the Word of God declares that you and I must have self-control, there's a reason why it's so important to be part of our armor. Because with the same mouth, I can either choose to insult and break down, or I can decide to build up and encourage other people. Let you and I decide we want to be those people who are builders who encourage, who have the fruit of the Spirit of love, joy, peace, patience. Let us be gentle. Let us be kind. Let us have goodness. And let us have self-control. Amen. Amen. Father God, we thank you this morning. We can simply come before you. And we realize once again this morning, Lord God, that we fall so short so many times because we are mere human. 
And we mess up and we make mistakes, but we know that in you there is forgiveness. In you there is restoration. In you there is another chance that we can try to do better. And therefore, as we sit before you this morning, Father God, we want to commit to you that, Lord, help us to grow. Help us to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Help us to that when people look at us as this tree, that we will truly be that tree planted by the waters, the rivers, and that we will produce fruit in season. And everything we do, that we will prosper in that. I will praise, Father God, that you will help us to be gentle, to be kind, to show goodness, to show mercy to other people around us so that they can read the open letter that we are representing you, Lord Jesus. And when they look at us, they can see Jesus. Pray that you will be glorified in and through us, Father. And even us as a family, we were sitting here, and maybe we have heard this word this morning, that we right now can make a decision to say, yes, Lord, I want, I want to do better. I can do better. I can do better. And if we are sitting here and we have been hurt, we have been hurt by words and we have wounds. I thank you, Lord God, that you are the God who heal those wounds. And that when we have the scars to show that we've been through difficulties, we know it's all to your glory. Just like you, Jesus, have the scars to show the price you have paid for us to have life in abundance. Be glorified in and through us as a family. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. Thanks for receiving the word this morning.